Hi, this is a strange movie. I found it after watching a short film online called Hysterical Girl that was supposed to be at the South by Southwest festival if it had happened this year. It was a modern reimagining of the perspective of Ida, the 14 year old girl that Sigmund Freud saw for a whole 11 weeks before she stopped meeting with him because he kept trying to get her to agree to his fucked up interpretation of things. Reading about her led me to reading about another person some years earlier named Bertha Pappenheim, which is a fantastic name. Bertha Pappenheim was- okay, I won't say her full name every time. Bertha was a patient of Freud's colleague Joseph Breuer, and was written about by Freud and Breuer, who called her by the pseudonym Anna O, because they moved the B and P of her initials back one letter each. But I'll call her Bertha because a fictionalized version of Bertha is a character in this film we're here to talk about, When Nietzsche Wept. Bertha was in fact the first person to ever experience psychoanalysis, at the time a newfangled psychological treatment involving conversation, also known as the talking cure. Bertha even played a role in the development of the talking cure, apparently preferring to talk freely and do free association, rather than being hypnotized or mesmerized. Fans of popular daddy and hypnotist Sigmund Freud will be happy to know that he's in the film a bunch as a young 25 year old, and even does some hypnosis at the climax of the film, which we'll get to in a bit. In the film, Freud is kind of mentored by Breuer, but also very much works on equal footing with him, and gives him help and guidance at important points. Freud is a mellowing voice of reason in this film for some reason, and he's consulted by Breuer throughout the movie about his special new patient, who is, drumroll please, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is at a pretty unstable point in his life, and the film opens up with someone close to him named Lou Salome meeting with Breuer to ask him to help Nietzsche. Since Nietzsche isn't famous yet, the doctor hasn't heard of him, but he is clearly intrigued by the aura of freedom that Lou Salome exudes, which is a theme that will certainly come up later. Lou was also a real person, a writer and psychoanalyst, who did in fact know Nietzsche and Freud, and who really was proposed to by Nietzsche and said no at least once. In the film, she's concerned that Nietzsche is suffering and may even be a danger to himself. She visits Dr. Breuer at his office unexpectedly a week later to tell him again how important it is to meet with Nietzsche, saying, You are the only doctor qualified for this psychological treatment. Nietzsche at the moment is suffering with extremely painful migraines that seem to be debilitating. He begrudgingly goes to Dr. Joseph, where he gets a full examination and then gets asked by Joseph about his dating life, with the doctor saying it's connected to his illness. Obviously, Joseph knows more than he's letting on when he asks this, since it's Lou Salome who set up the appointment. When Nietzsche doesn't want to go into his current romantic life, Dr. Breuer, in a melodramatic, tough love, patronizing, and very unethical way, says he can't work with Nietzsche if he won't talk about his dating situation. As Nietzsche leaves, right outside the office, we see him feverishly defend a horse from getting hit and then sort of fall down in a nervous reaction kind of way. This is the movie telling us, oh, don't worry, he's gonna head back to Dr. Joseph. And the scene, interestingly enough, is actually based on a real event where Nietzsche defended a horse from being hit while he was apparently wandering around experiencing a sort of mania. Anyway, before they meet again, Dr. Joseph reads Nietzsche's books and talks with Freud about them. Before I go any further, yes, this is fiction. They didn't have a relationship, Nietzsche and Breuer, and neither did Nietzsche and Freud, though it's clear that Freud had a substantial familiarity with Nietzsche's ideas. One article about the real-life Lou Salome that we'll come back to later puts it this way. Freud famously was aware of similarities in their outlook, but was resistant to engaging with Nietzsche in a way that might indebt him specifically to the philosopher. Classic. After Freud reads Nietzsche's books, he says, I've read his books. He has more penetrating knowledge of mankind than any other person. I think he may be perhaps the greatest psychologist who has ever lived. Which is apparently not something Freud would have said. But Freud is more of a plot device than a representation of reality in this film. He gives Joseph the advice of being more vulnerable in his work with Nietzsche, of fully disclosing himself, as Freud puts it. Joseph really takes this and runs with it, coming up with an idea which is, I would say, grossly unethical. I propose a professional exchange. For one month, I will act as physician to your body. 
If you were Lactus physician to my mind. What do you mean? That you doctor me and I... I teach you philosophy? No, no, no. Not teach me. Heal me. Of what? Despair. Joseph has been asked to cure Nietzsche's despair, and here he is asking Nietzsche to cure his despair. This is pretty unprofessional. No matter how talented your clients or patients are, you don't have them help you with your despair. And he clearly uses coercion. You can pay your debt by saving my life the way I saved yours. My motivation is entirely self-serving. Meaning he was full-on lying about giving him these services for free. But the movie feels like it wants us to clap for Dr. Breuer's vulnerability rather than criticize his coercion. Anyway, why is Dr. Breuer despairing? Well, in a sort of characteristically unprofessional way, he's grieving no longer working with Bertha Pappenheim, who I realized on rewatch he worked with a full two years before the events in this film take place. So, you know, that's kind of a long time to grieve a client you worked with, though it may be normal for a clinician to in some sense feel a bit of loss after no longer working with someone we've worked with for a while. Usually this is because we finished working together, or they moved, or they just decided to stop going to therapy, or any other reason besides what happens in this film. It's hard to empathize with Dr. Breuer when he had to terminate care because he crossed boundaries with Bertha and fell in love, leading to his wife demanding he stop working with her. Another thing I caught on rewatch is Joseph mentions at one point his wife having been friends with Bertha and her mom, and we see a scene I'll talk about at the end of my video where they play cards together, so add that to the intersectionality of how fucked up Joseph's unprofessionalism was in the film. There are a lot of challenges of being a therapist, but avoiding falling in love with a client is not one of them. I mean, I'm a social worker, I don't know if it's different for psychiatrists or was back in 1882. Our ethic is you never do any romantic shit at all with a client, even any amount of years after you work together. It's pretty fucking obvious why this is important. That's just always off the table and you always think and act like it. You will always be the only man in my life. So he broke that rule number one and then had to terminate care due to his own wrongdoing and then two years later is in such a state of complicated fucked up grief that he needs help from none other than Nietzsche. And as the film shows us, probably realistically, when you get help from Nietzsche you get a very unique kind of help. For example, Nietzsche has Joseph imagining insulting Bertha, or imagining Bertha at times when she was flipping out, or as a grown infant, or even gasp taking a dump. <laughs> what the fuck? He makes him cry and has him yell, I hate you, over and over. This isn't how you do therapy, in case you're wondering, but at times Nietzsche does simply engage Joseph in conversation like a therapist would. After the experience with Bertha, Joseph has clearly learned nothing, and he's carrying on a new professional relationship with 100% unethical boundary crossing to try to feel better. In this conversation, Joseph goes on about how he identifies Bertha with color and magic and passion. Life without Bertha would be a colorless one. That's what Bertha represents. Life without passion, without mystery? Who can live such a life? You're pretty worked up there, Joseph, about how you can't imagine life without that client you're unprofessionally obsessing over two years after you had to stop meeting with her because you crossed an uncrossable boundary. Maybe there's some guilt under that little anger, buddy? But basically, he feels repressed and longs to feel free, yada yada yada. The form of the film is that Nietzsche teaches Joseph how to get out of his comfort zone, which leads to the happy conclusion of him finding his comfort zone again because he remembers why he liked it so much. Plus, there's a lot of horse imagery. There was that first scene I mentioned with Nietzsche and the horse, and then when the doctor yells out, I hate you, while in his carriage because he was trained by Nietzsche to yell that when he thinks about Bertha, and he thinks about Bertha while in the carriage, and it causes the horses to stop and stuff. As a side note, I hesitantly bring this up, 
I'm not the arbiter of what's a normal and an abnormal age gap in relationships, and the relationships in this film have many other interesting problems besides this, if this is a problem. But I think it's worth mentioning that at the time this film takes place, 1882, the real life Lou Salome was 21 and Nietzsche was 38, while Bertha Pappenheim was 23 and Joseph Breuer was 40. So both were 17 year age gap relationships between the characters, which I'm not saying that's evil or something, but it's a notable commonality. So it can be said that this film is in a sense, just a good old fashioned bro drama about two men getting over their boundary crossing attachments to women two decades younger than them. At some point, this film drops the fact that Joseph's mom's name was Bertha too, by the way, and she died when he was three, which apparently was true on both counts strangely enough. It would feel contrived as a plot point if it wasn't true, one of those truth is stranger than fiction moments. So Joseph's excessive, unhealthy, and unprofessional attachment to his previous patient, Bertha Pappenheim, was in some way driven by his grief about losing his mother, Bertha Breuer, and now after losing the patient two years ago, he's been in a state of double grief. Nietzsche helps him make these connections. Joseph realizes he craves the freedom and lack of duty that Nietzsche represents. He feels shackled by his life. To help him through his existential crisis, Nietzsche shares the idea of eternal recurrence. Every pain, every joy, every unutterably small or great thing in your life will just return to you. The same succession, same sequence, again and again, like an hourglass of time. Imagine infinity. Consider the possibility that every action you choose, Joseph, you choose for all time. This is a real philosophical idea that Nietzsche wrote about. In fact, remember that article about Lou Salome that I mentioned earlier and said I'd bring up again? Well, the real life Lou Salome really was close with both Nietzsche and with Freud, even living with Nietzsche and another guy for some time, as well as exchanging letters back and forth with Freud. In Lou's autobiography, she wrote about a conversation with Freud about Nietzsche's affirmation of life in his doctrine of life's eternal recurrence, whereupon to the thought of the recurrence of the selfsame life, Freud responds, one bad cold would cure me of such a desire. This further leads Lou Salome to reflect on how the attitudes she held in her early 20s have been tempered, especially as she was witnessing Freud's agonizing struggle with his cancer. She could not bear to think of the eternal recurrence of the suffering, not of the self, but of others, where the original doctrine does not take this eventuality into account. Nietzsche and others wrote about eternal recurrence as a fact of nature, meaning that everything is and does return, but this also gets bound up with a discussion of amorphity or love of fate, which Nietzsche used in his work to challenge people to live the life that they would in a sense be proud to return to. This meaning is more so what the film refers to when it talks about eternal recurrence, this ought aspect rather than the is aspect of saying the world does in fact return. And in Salome's comments, she makes it clear that Freud criticized how anyone could want to live again, given the natural pains of sickness and illness, as well as the suffering of others. This whole movie is based on a book by a very well-known psychologist, Irvin Yalom, from 15 years earlier. I read a book by Yalom about group therapy when I was getting a social work degree, and I have to confess I didn't do all of the readings, but he seemed intelligent and he communicated his ideas in an entertaining way. So I was sort of intrigued when I realized halfway through watching the film that it was based on a book he'd written. It's a cool idea to apply philosophy to psychology as this movie does, and if you want to hear more thoughts about that, you can check out the video I did telling philosophy majors to go into mental health professions. The way the story applies Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence is by having Freud hypnotize Joseph to get Joseph to basically live out in his head what it would be like to give up all responsibilities, his job and his family, and to live completely, quote unquote, freely. We don't realize it's a hypnotic vision at first, and we just see Joseph leave his family. 
It's possible that I'm just cynical and jaded, but honestly, I couldn't help laughing at the melodrama of this scene as well as most of the other scenes, honestly. I wouldn't really recommend the film from like an acting and writing standpoint. It feels kind of overdone, but maybe that's just me being repressed and defensive to its powerful drama. I only have one life! He gets decked out in his finest hat, coat, and cane, and goes and finds Bertha, where he sees her schmoozing with a cute young doctor. Joseph sneaks up to get a closer view and get ready for another groaner of a melodramatic moment, because Joseph hears her say the same exact thing to some other guy that she said to him. You will always be the only man in my life. Joseph freaks out, shaves his beard, goes without a hat and a cane, gets a job as a waiter, then tries to drown himself after Freud sees him waiting tables. But as I said, it was all a hypnotic vision. He didn't leave his family, and he's very much happy for the second chance at that decision. Personally, I had a few problems with this whole thing. Why does the film have Bertha say the same sweet thing to another man? Isn't the whole point that Joseph gets to live out his fantasy and see that it doesn't work and doesn't make him actually happy? Why stop the fantasy so short? Why not let him reconnect with Bertha and realize the relationship could never work? Not because she's been oh so disloyal and is with someone else now, but because it was a relationship built on an impossible, unstable, unhealthy power dynamic from the beginning. In the same vein, why not realize that waiting tables doesn't feel as fulfilling as being a doctor? and have him learn that from his fantasy, rather than him simply learning that he was embarrassed to be seen by Freud and others. This is the climax of the film, but it just feels rushed. So anyways, when Breuer tells Nietzsche how he's doing so good now, Nietzsche opens up that he's still processing the grief of exploding his relationship with Lou. He certainly seems to remember it a bit differently than Lou, and he feels spurned. This happened in real life too. Nietzsche got really heartbroken when Lou Salome didn't want to be in a romantic relationship with him or marry him or anything like that. Finally in the film, Joseph admits to Nietzsche that Lou set this all up and they bond Bond. The movie ends with titles about what the characters went on to do after the conclusion of the plot, and apparently Breuer never did talk therapy again after Bertha. I can't say I'm surprised. I didn't go into all these details, but in real life, Bertha's symptoms happened right after her dad passed away, so Freud and Breuer saw her symptoms through the lens of her losing her father. The stress of grief can certainly have profound impacts but in a typical psychoanalytical way, they ran the risk of ignoring rival hypotheses. And while all the romantic stuff between Breuer and Bertha seems to be fiction, Breuer and Freud don't seem to have helped Bertha much. According to some sources, like this article, Bertha may have had a neurological issue such as epilepsy that was exacerbated by drug dependence. I'm sure it helped her in some degree to talk with someone, especially since in real life, Breuer wasn't falling in love with her. Real life, Bertha Pappen was a successful social worker, actually, and she never talked about her experience with Breuer with others, even when it was revealed at some point in her adult life that she was Anna O. Oh. Kind of a super fucked up and re-traumatizing thing to have happen. On the Wikipedia page for the book this film is based on, it says this story is all about limerence. And that was a new word to me. If it's new to you too, let's explain it really quick. It's a word coined by Dorothy Tenov, who did a big study of love and published a book called Love and Limerence in 1979. While my one hour borrowing period for this book from archive.org is still in effect, let's see what Dorothy wrote introduced the concept. To be in the state of limerence is to feel what is usually termed being in love. It appears that love and sex can coexist without limerence, in fact that any of the three may exist without the others. Human beings are extremely sensitive to each other and easily bruised by rejection or made joyful when given signs of appreciation. When a friendship runs into difficulties, we suffer. When we are able to share our lives with others in the pleasure of what is perceived as mutual understanding and concern, we are strengthened. The person who is not limerent towards you may feel great affection and concern for you, even tenderness, and possibly sexual desire as well. 
A relationship that includes no limerence may be a far more important one in your life, when all is said and done, than any relationship in which you experienced the strivings of limerent passion. Limerence is not in any way preeminent among types of human attractions or interactions, but when limerence is in full force, it eclipses other relationships. It's a concept that helps us understand the difference between loving and being in love, and trust me, there's a difference. One is not better than the other, but they are different, and they go different ways. Limerence brings people more of a feeling of ecstasy, is one way to put it, but it also comes with what Dorothy talks about as a greater risk of self-harm and suicide and frustration during the fluctuations of the limerent relationship. To a less severe degree, this may be something many of us have experienced. Have you ever been dating someone or wanted to be dating someone, and either because the relationship is new and you're infatuated with them, or because you're not happy in the rest of your own life? You find that you can go from depressed to elated just by getting a text from them, or go from elated to depressed just by not getting a text from them. I certainly haven't enjoyed the times when I've felt this way, but it's given me insight into myself and into what I think limerence is. Limerence applies to when Nietzsche wept because of the dramatically negative ways that these two men were affected by the frustrations blocking the fulfillment of their desire towards Lou and Bertha. Everybody has the right to grieve a relationship, I'm not trying to shame them for caring. And limerence isn't a bad thing necessarily, but it is an unstable thing. Okay, enough about limerence, I hope that was somewhat interesting. I want to make one more point before I finish, okay? This is a detail I only noticed watching watching it a second time, but I want to explain. So Joseph crossed an uncrossable line by falling in love with his patient, Bertha, right? And I said that Joseph's wife made him stop working with Bertha. But what I didn't mention is this actually happened specifically because Bertha had a sort of flare-up of her symptoms, which were called hysteria, basically a nervous reaction or nervous breakdown coupled with cramps and other physical pain. In this one that Bertha has in the film, it's during a card game with her mom and Joseph's wife. And Bertha, in a clearly unwell state of mind, says she's pregnant with Dr. Breuer's child and sort of laughs maniacally. Now this is what causes Joseph's wife to demand he stop meeting with her. And when I saw this on rewatch, I was just kind of pissed off. Because if you think about it, that technically could have happened without Dr. Breuer crossing boundaries with Bertha. I mean, if she was really in a mentally unwell state, that could have been the case. And as it turns out, the real life Bertha Pappenheim may have said something actually very similar to this, though to Dr. Breuer himself, not to his wife. This is according to Steven Zweig, an Austrian novelist who according to a Wikipedia citation of a book in German I couldn't find an English PDF of, he apparently writes that Breuer told him about this. So real-life Breuer couldn't handle the counter-transference of a client saying something admittedly somewhat disturbing, but something that a professional should be able to hear and deal with. I think it's odd that the logic of the film works such that Breuer's wife is to blame for him terminating care with Bertha, and that she does so in a way that doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Since, as I said, having a flare-up of Bertha's symptoms for the specific things they all know she's being treated for, which is physical pains and emotional anguish, doesn't seem like a good reason in and of itself to force Dr. Breuer to terminate care. And I find this kind of offensive since there was such an overwhelmingly justified and necessary reason for him to terminate care already, his own behavior. It just reminds me of the whole Adam and Eve thing where men mythologize the blaming of women for things. Like, oh, thanks a lot, Eve. It was your fault. You took the damn apple. Of course, no one in the film blames Joseph's wife for terminating care with birth because whether she had just good intuition or she had other information, we know she was correct to do that. And yet, listen to this. In the doctor's first session with his own therapist, Mr. Nietzsche, the film gives us Nietzsche responding to Joseph's story of boundary crossing with Bertha and of how he hurt Bertha by asking him, You are responsible for all of your thoughts and deeds. But she... By virtue of this so-called illness, she is exonerated from everything. Who has damaged whom? Who has weakened whom? 
Doesn't this cripple Bertha, as you call her, have greater power over you? And instead of Joseph responding, well, regardless of whether her mental state impacted her degree of agency, she was the patient and I was the doctor, so no, she receives no blame at all for hurting my feelings in any way, which would have been the reasonable thing for Joseph to say, he says instead, An excellent beginning. He even developed a list of my problems. In a narrational way that feels like the film agrees with. That's kind of unsettling. In my view, given everything else we've discussed here, it shows how Nietzsche and Joseph were helping each other on a personal level, like two members of a group therapy group, not as professionals alternating in turn, which is an unethical and impossible dual relationship. It's great that they seem to help each other improve, though, since we can hope that each fictional character did less harm afterwards than they would have done had they not had that bonding experience. Thanks for watching, y'all. Check out my other vids and tell your friends and your enemies as well. Tell everybody I got a lot of videos. I got this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and others. Check them all out and uh, let me know what you think. I'm really, really curious. I work hard on this stuff and really appreciate all the feedback I've gotten on previous videos and future videos if we follow the idea of eternal recurrence. All right, thanks.